My name is Marilyn Bowering, and I'm here at uh, near the foot of Russell Street of Victoria West, by the West Song Walkway. I'm on the traditional territories of the Lekwungen peoples, known now as the Esquimalt and Songhees Nations, and I'm grateful to be able to read and to write and to live on this territory. It's one of my favorite places because of the way the edge of wildness bumps up against the city. And if you walk along here, you can see seals, otters, all kinds of birds. There's a heronry not far away, um, and you can watch them in the evening fishing in the mud flats. I'd like to read a poem about returning to live in this area after having been away for a long time. Um, I actually have lived in most neighborhoods in Victoria. My father built houses, and uh, every time he built one and sold one, we moved. So returning here, I love to go for walks and realize that I was also revisiting the past, revisiting my childhood to a great degree, and trying to understand what this was going to mean for me. The poem is called Happiness. When I go looking, I have a card in my pocket and a note in the bottom of my shoes. My family will need to know what happened. I carry keys in case everyone is absent the day I return. I know it has to do with the sea and a fixed aid to navigation giving cardinal direction, although I'm not about to set sail. Mostly my eyes are on the ground where people drop clues, gloves, hats, tissues before they continue. The world will end, but not its sadness. That island so close that if the tide were out, I could walk to it, once held the bodies of the dead in its wind-stunted trees. I am looking instead, let me say it, for happiness. The whole affair gives me the sense of heading out into open waters. Yet I linger under a green umbrella and deconstruct chewing gum wrappers and crushed beer cans and track a hermit crab as it clicks and clambers out of its shell and looks for another. My heart remains quiet and so I listen without giving consent to the wave's cursive account of my life. It is difficult to change. I could climb to the height of that island once the waters retreat, but it is flood time now and I see what I see with a pen light and the quick skipping beam of a lighthouse, its pulse like a heartbeat. What I'll come back with, I have no idea. But happiness is always ready to speak. Advance, it says. Undress and enter the currents. But above all, keep up with your finite measure of time and its drumbeat and call out through the shoals without stopping. Hello, 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 hello. Words for Traveling by Water Those for whom there are words may lose themselves in forests, blindly, not listening, and stagger under a weight with scarred hands and wake up with wounds, but will hear only praise. Words loud, cursive, clear as the calving of glaciers. They swim naked, stretched darkly with breath like a curved spoon, crying like gulls to the wave-skimming wind, this is me, this is who I truly am. And when they are most alone, shadowy ancestors nod, saying, who is it you belong to? Stop at our fire, take these phrases and keep them warm. 
those for whom there are words always find each other, that is all. You don't have to believe, just say, the sea. Repeat after me, sea, your blue, your thousand years of voices. How many repetitions until you end and the broken sea can be renamed love. Russell Street is in the midst of change. Um, uh, it has this mix of different kinds of housing and businesses um, that I find really attractive. So I don't know what will happen, but I hope it doesn't lose its character and its vibrancy. One kind of change, though, that cannot be stopped at this point is some effect of climate change. And I was thinking one night about what this could mean to the street and also to all the people. Russell Street. When the waters rise and cover the patio, the lights along the street go out. First, up the hill at the school. Then the Portuguese cafe on the corner. The windows at the warehouse are next, and then the stair and porch lamps. Whatever promises an entrance or exit. Even the whispery motion of fixtures are quiet no matter what swims up and withdraws the bolts from the doors. The wet seeps into the wires of each repaired heart in each bed, in each house, disrupts its rest and cedes control to the darkness. And so, when floodwaters rise from the foot of the road, over its instep and onto the patio, we light candles to summon the bright eyes of otters and call for the next door cats with a match. We bear ourselves to the insects, the sieved leaves and mud of their nests, whatever the storm drains on swallow. When it finally stops raining, we'll reside in this story or have moved underground or emerged on the backs of the most ancient of sturgeons to take their advice on what is worth saving, on what to throw back or become. When I moved into this area of Victoria West, I was pleased to find myself living near the old Ormond Biscuit Factory, a building I'd known since I was a child. I'd watch for the first glimpse of the sign that said Ormond Biscuits on the side of the building when we came to pick up my father from the BA Oil Company where, site where he worked. Um, there were great oil silos here in that period and um, that, that was built on top of former First Nations village sites. So I find that since I've known the city so long, everywhere I look I feel as if I'm looking through layers of time. This poem begins with a recollection of my first visit to Paris and then returns to where I'm standing right now. Biscuit Factory. Send my regards to the Paris streets, the poet wrote from exile in America. I will do the same to the room on Alma, close to the Eiffel Tower, where I stayed with Jeannie from Alaska and her Turkish friend Hanafe. One room with a hot plate for the three of us, a toilet near the stair where a man unlocked the door and stood laughing, admiring my panties, while his girlfriend emptied their furniture into the foyer. The night of my 24th birthday, the cards predicted disaster before I unfastened my handbag in the restaurant to pay. But someone had stolen my wallet and passport in the metro. It was a long way back to a street since erased by an upgrade. Hanafe knew a phone box where foreigners called long distance for free. I lined up behind Moroccans and Turks and phoned my mother at work where a quacule sun blazed on the wall behind her. At lunchtime, she went to the bank in her red high heels and sent me money. Why else am I here? but to wander until I remember the red brick Ormond Biscuit Factory 
near where my father worked in Victoria. Thick black fuel tanks sprang from the ground where condos now simper. My father climbed to the top of the silos on a winding steel ladder to document gauges. We drove up in the Chevy to fetch him for dinner. My mother in a red belted Peter Pan dress and stockings. He gave us treats, nickels, raisins, candies. He emptied his pockets. And then my brother and I climbed up the side of the vats as high as we could before our parents finished their kiss and noticed us. You know, the condos there now, where the oil tanks were, and the biscuit factory remade as self-storage, are nothing to what happened to the girls I thought were my friends and me. We lined up at Dior in Paris with the models and went in. Our hair shone like glass, and we glittered too, all three of us, with our fine, invisible, unusable talent.